boy, the other class was. Uh, does the red and black mean something? I mean, you got it across your chest. You're, you're one of the best schools in the state. Now, let, let's see if we can do that again. Good afternoon, Bulldogs. Yeah. Yeah. All right, that's what I like. Brandon Hardison, glad to be back again. And uh, I say it every year. I go to a lot of schools to speak. And when they enter the auditorium, they're all over the place. They're throwing things. Assistant principal or principal can't get them to quiet down. Every year that I come here, you folks are obedient, respectful. Listen to the adults. I love it. So please continue to do that. Jim Ellis is why I'm here for free. We do this on every campus city that we operate, whether it's Marietta, Kennesaw, Buford, or in Chambly. But they're the ones that allow me to come out and speak to you. So it's glad to be here, and I want to take this. How many of you in here are student athletes? Whether you do Drama, you don't have to do football, volleyball, but if you do drama, 4-H, I don't care. That means that you do something besides your classwork. So you can put your hands down. I thank you with that. That honor goes a long way because it's tough to juggle all of those things, especially if you're doing two or three different things throughout the school year. So be proud. I'm also a former student athlete. I never wanted to go to the pros. I just wanted somebody to pay for my college. So I was fortunate that I went to Wisconsin on a football track scholarship. Somebody paid for it, and I said, thank you. But you had to work. So how many of you like practice? Boy, the hands went down from before here with that. See, I'll leave you with this if you don't remember anything else. It's better to be prepared for an opportunity that never comes than have an opportunity come and you're not prepared. That's why you practice. That's why you practice in anything that you do. So today what we're going to do is look at another first, but I need you to help me, so I have some people that are going to pass out some handouts. We're going to learn about a person who did a lot of firsts, and after we read a little bit, after we watch a short little video, we'll wind it down with a Q and A session, but I'm going to let you know the key thing about the Q and A is going to be dealing with firsts. Who remembers all the firsts that you'll hear about this person? Last year when I was here, and we talked about the situation of Rosa Parks, but these two young ladies before Rosa Parks, and we said, how come they're not in the history books? Well, we can't put every event in our books. They would be too big. In other words, every battle and conflict with the Indians as we were moving west, we can't put it into the book. Everything that happened in politics in 1776 in Philadelphia as we're trying to become a nation, we couldn't put all that in the books. It would be long. So when it comes to African American history, it's the same way. We can't put all the stories in there. So I give you a little supplemental, and hopefully you can pick up something from that. Now, the reason why I like to do interactive when I was teaching, I didn't like lectures. I want to hear, want to listen, want to see. So who can read first? Boy, no. Oh, thank you. And just speak loud. Continue. Synopsis. Well, let me help out first. What, what grade is this? Middle school. Oh, synopsis. Okay, go ahead. Continue.
Okay, you got through it. Uh, and that's the second time I heard it. I didn't say nothing to the last group. Uh, is it Illinois or Illinois? Oh, okay. Just wanted to make sure. Okay. Who wants to read next? Thank you. Next. Young man in the back. Pollard received a Rockefeller scholarship to attend Brown University in 1915, and he became a college football standout despite his modest 5'9", 165-pound stature. He was the first African-American to play on the Rose Bowl, and, ended, and at the end of the 1915 season and 1916, he led Brown back-to-back -back wins in the Ivy League powerhouses Harvard and Yale in a route to a 1-8 overall record. For his efforts, he was honored the first African American running back named running back named to Walter Camp's All American team. Thank you. Now he said a lot in there. Uh, how many of you have heard of Harvard, Yale, yeah. Princeton? Okay. Any of you know who the first two colleges before there was a professional NFL? Anybody know who the first two colleges who played a football game? Okay, uh, I'll just move on. One was Rutgers, which is the State College of New Jersey, and they played against then called the College of New Jersey. Now it's called Princeton. But Princeton and Rutgers played the first football game ever, and because of these Ivy Leagues, Northeast, they were the powerhouses at that time. The Midwest, the South, like SEC teams, they, 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 they'll come later. So everything that you hear about what's going on comes from the Northeast. And one other thing for the ladies in here, all of those Ivy schools were all male schools up until 1975. All boy schools. You, you couldn't go to an Ivy school if you were a female. Aren't you glad that's changed now? Yeah. Oh, good. Next, who wants to read? Yes. Pro football pioneer. After leaving Brown, Pollard briefly pursued a degree in dentistry before joining the military and serving as a director of an Army YMCA. He was employed as the football coach at Lincoln University in 1919 when he was recruited to play for the Army Pros, the professional football team, Akron Pros, a professional football team of Ohio. The Pros joined the American Professional Football Association in 1920. One of the just two African American players in the league, along with Bobby Markley, Pollard led his team to an 8-3 record in the AFA's first finals. The following year, he began. He again proved a dominant player while doubling as the first African American coach in the league. Excellent, excellent. Is there one more paragraph on the first page? Okay, now we're going to stop there. Thank you. Uh, the back is just for you because it's going to help you with the Q&A. But anybody remember when did the NFL start? She, she just read it. How come they didn't have a Super Bowl back then? Uh, the two leagues didn't merge yet. I'll take that. How come they didn't have a Super Bowl way back then? Okay, um, well, I'll take that. I'll take one more and then I'll give you something to think about. Um, was it really like enough teams to go in a large bracket with? It was only like a couple of teams? 
Okay? Okay. I'll take it, but let me throw it to you this way. Sunday's game is going to be played in the brand new Mercedes-Benz Stadium. What's, what's the capacity of seating? The idea. Just give me a round number. 70,000, 80,000. How many people do you think were watching professional football back in the 20s? Not that many. I happened to see the first Super Bowl. It was just a game. People didn't even watch the whole thing. The first three were just, eh. Then eventually it caught on, and now it's the way you see it now. But at the beginning, people don't like change too much until you convince them that there's something to want to do. Now, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to play a short little video. Please be cognizant and watch that. Then we're going to tie it all together at the end. So if we can have the video up. The Roaring Twenties were known as the golden age of sport, but only for white America. College football was a big city game, played with little color. Another version was small towns and dusty sandlots. They called it postgraduate football until a few ragtag teams banded together in 1920 to form the National Football League. Here, all the white faces were joined by a single black one. His name was Frederick Douglas Pollard, son of a Native American mother and a West Indian father raised in a German suburb of Chicago, where they called him Fritz. He was one of a kind. He was a, a pioneer. One of the things uh, he first did was to uh, appear in the, uh, in the Rose Bowl game, the first Rose Bowl game in 1916. He was the first black to make Walter Camp's uh, All-American. He was the first black quarterback in the National Football League. He was the first black coach in the National Football League. Then, uh, outside of his football career, he started the first black tabloid in, in New York City in 1935. In Chicago, he had uh, the first black investment firm in the United States. And then uh, he became uh, an agent, and he began to represent uh, uh, black entertainers. He achieved so much. It wasn't just football. He was a man on a mission. And I think uh, in his 90-plus years, he attempted and uh, he accomplished so much. I think I'm a very, very fortunate man, and I'm still able to get around and very thankful that I'm alive enough to be able to have my picture taken and you gentlemen to come and see me. In 1974, NFL Films visited Fritz. Most of that interview was never used until now. My father was a great champion boxer in the Civil War days, and he learned the barber trade and he moved up to a place called Rogers Park, way on the north side of Chicago, a suburb of Chicago. Rogers Park was all German. My people were the only blacks in the area. They were the only blacks in the schools. They were Americans, and they were not going to be confined, and they were not going to be marginalized uh, just because uh, their skin happened to be black. When we went out for the football team down at Lane Tech High School, my brother said, hey, where'd my kid brother? You haven't given him a chance. He said, well, I'm not going to play unless you give my kid brother a chance to play. So they gave me, because of my brother, they gave me a chance to play in at 89 pounds on this Lane Tech High School football team. In four years, Fritz gained 60 pounds and a place on the Cook County All-Star team, a first for a young man of color. There are people in Chicago talk with my mother and trying to get me to go to Brown University. So it's an interesting kind of history that almost no blacks were ever allowed to go to, quote, white colleges. So the fact that, that Chris Pollard did and had, had done so well is it's extraordinary. Uh, he would break on the scene against Harvard and Yale. And of course, at that time, it's hard to explain today because these teams are not very powerful anymore. They were college football. Pollard, in effect, uh, ran wild uh, against both of them. It was a revelation that this uh, young black man who was uh, so small could do this. Uh, all of a sudden, he went from a very marginal player uh, to uh, one that was getting national recognition. 
But his dreams were even bigger. He was a hero. My father was a hero. When Brown beat Yale, that was all that they needed to write. Pollard beat Yale. They give him anything he wanted. Anything. One reward was a trip on a cross-country pullman to play in the first ever Rose Bowl. Of course, at that time, it was very unusual for any black person, much less a, a young athlete, to be, be on a Pullman car. The Pullman uh, porters uh, wouldn't serve Pollard. Some of the hotels wouldn't accept him when they got on the West Coast. So it, it was more than just football. It was, uh, it was testing, again, the, the racial barriers that this uh, uh, Rose Bowl game. But it did give him a lot of visibility. Brown lost to Washington that day, but Fritz Pollard had already earned the greater victory. For the first time, a black man could claim the title, All-American. His rise from Rogers Park had been swift, but the biggest challenge lay just ahead. There wasn't any knowledge of pro football to amount to anything at that during those days. It was after I finished at Brown and I went down to University of Pennsylvania and I studied dentistry, and they came to me by playing pro football. And that's how I happened to play against Jim Thorpe and some of his Indians. Naturally, I had heard about the great Jim Thorpe and whatnot, but I imagine he had heard about the great Fred Pollard because I had a name at that time, too. You know, his mom was a football at Indian. He meets uh, Jim Thorpe on the field, and Thorpe is giving him the once over, looking at him like, who can this guy be, and what are you doing here? And Jim said, hello, little black boy. I said, hello, big black boy. And he looked at me, you know. And it stunned. Uh, Jim Thorpe because no one ever spoke to him that way and he said you as black as I am and he said and I'm as much Indian as you are I said well we're going to play against each other we'll find out who's going to be the blackest after this game these weren't Ivy League frat boys across the line the roustabouts of the NFL were out to teach the young black all-american a lesson pro football back in those days was pretty rough as small as I was no one had any sympathy for me at all. No one was pulling for him, all pulling against him. And every game was a challenge, one for survival. And the word passed around to fellows that we didn't want blacks in pro football, and let's get him. They used to hit me one on top, one and below, in order to try to take me out. They're trying to break his legs and hurt his arms and all kinds of stuff. Some of them were a little rough with them, but uh, I didn't think it was a thing to do. And then when they would do it, they would say, well, you little black, I'll get you the next time. Uh, I think he was the most abused of all of them. And he resented it. And he made them pay for it. And I don't blame him. He was good. I'd look at him and grin. They didn't get mad and want to fight him. Just look, look at him and get grin, and the next minute run 80 yards for a touchdown. Pollard and his youth was a little more arrogant than most of them. But uh, I think he had a reason to be. And I wanted the honor of having been the first black coach more than anything else. Fritz not only held his own, he actually won his enemies over as the player coach of the Akron Pros. Then the coal region of Pennsylvania called. Those fellows came out of the mines and came up to play football. Never went to college. Never saw the inside of a high school. And I said, what kind of a little old town is this anyway? He said, you know black people around, and you never see any and whatnot. I said, they're going to give me hell out there. It was a difficult experience for him because, as he said, they had never seen a black man in the coal region. In fact, uh, the first game he played at uh, Weston Field at Shenandoah at halftime, because of threats made against him, uh, his team, which was the, uh, the Gilberton Catamounts, uh, stayed in the middle of the field because they were afraid to get near the fans because somebody might uh, uh, do Fritz Pollard in. But uh, he, like throughout his life, uh, he won respect and admiration of people even in the coal region. Fritz left pro football just in time to join the Harlem Renaissance of the 1930s. The thing about his career in football and even after football was this whole line of achievement. He moved to New York, he went into coal business, and he moved up to the newspaper business, and he went into the entertainment business, and he was just so persistent and tenacious and charming. The impact of the rights movement 
from Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta and all that that brought forth a revolution and the fact that Mr. Pollard was a first in a way in a very quiet revolution the fact that he was so resilient is extraordinary and that's what makes him memorable that he was so resilient sadly Fritz Pollard's efforts on behalf of African-American athletes are just a faded memory but his story is worth retelling if only to introduce the players of today to the man who 80 years ago carried the ball for all of them. Okay, so most people never heard of Fritz Pollard. So we just wanted to give you something a little bit different, but here's just a little footnote. He will have five sons, his first or eldest son, Junior, Fritz Junior. In those days, even though his father got away with it, his son couldn't get away with it because now the South, Southeast Conference, Big 12, people were getting bigger. So his son went to North Dakota State, and he, he was a legend. Also, anybody remember the 36 Olympics? Anybody know where that was held? Say it again. Fritz Jr. was with the Olympic team with Jesse Owens, but they don't talk about Fritz Jr. They talk about Jesse Owens. Once again, we can't put everything in the books, so we pick and choose what we want to pick in. So that's why I try to fill in the gaps. So let's wind it down. Who can give me a first that Fritz Pollard had by a show of hand? What's one of the first? Uh, big up just a little bit. Okay, very good. Who's, who's got the goodies? What's another one? First African American to play in the Rose Bowl. Very good. First African American to be a quarterback. Very good. Yes, sir. First African American to be on the All American team. Very good. Yes, in the back. First African American to play football. Very good. Yes. First African American. First African American that people have seen in the Okay. Very good. Well, did somebody turn over the sheet? Do you see something in the back that maybe we didn't see? Uh, he was the first African American in, in college football. Okay. Very good. Yes. First African We'll take it. You got it. Yes, ma'am. Uh, okay. He, he said one, but we'll still give it to you. He had the first investment firm. Ah, first investment firm. Very good. Uh, tabloid. You're right. Say it louder, so they can. Entertainment business, he was a, what do they call it? Uh, say, say it again, agent, we'll, we'll, we'll take that. Yes, and you're saying, well, I don't know what that is, but yeah, there's Hall of Fames everywhere. Is, is that all the firsts? Did I miss one? Do I see a hand? Because the lights are on me here. Uh, yes, several businesses. Name one. Uh, I'll help you out before the bell rings for anybody, but uh, raise your hand, don't holler it out. Remember it said that he went to college for dent dentist dent So if you go to college for dentistry, what do you do? Say again. Very good. <laughs> Well, uh, first African American quarterback. Didn't somebody say that already? Yeah, somebody said that. Okay. Well, g give it to him anyway. Well, it's Friday. It's Friday. Shh, 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 shh. Can't hear. Very good. See, Nancy. That's why I left the back open because there was more firsts on the back of the sheet. If you would have taken time to do it. How much time do we have left? 
About two minutes. I'm trying, trying to keep it there. Say it louder. Very good. Give it to him with that. So once again, all he's simply trying to say, once the NFL said, well, we got too many blacks, we, we, we're going to, they went on their own and started their own. Excellent. Yes, sir. To play for Brown University. Very good. Yes, sir. Okay, we'll take that. First to receive that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, could you speak up just a little bit? Ah, Pro Football Hall of Fame. Yes, sir. Do you know what the alliance is? I'll let you go. I won't hold you for that. But you're going to hear that after the Super Bowl. Yes. Tab, well, did somebody say tabloid? Ah, give it to him anyway. Yes. First to go to Brown, give you that. Yes, sir. Yes. Well, that was something different. First to play a football game on the West Coast. Ah! Say it again. Very good, because nobody had ever gone West. Remember, it was the first Rose Bowl, so very good. All the way in the back near the cameraman. Um, he worked as a casting agent, a studio manager, and a producer in the engineering room. Give it to him, young man. Two, two rows up. Speak up, speak up. Uh, give it to him. I think we heard that already, but I'll, I, I'll give it to you for your tenacity. <laughs> oh! First African American to play, because remember I asked you about Jim Thorpe. Oh boy, Jim Thorpe was considered to be the best athlete in the first half of the 1900s. Chicago Blackhawks, very good. Last one. Shh, 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 shh. I'm sorry. Say it again. Get it to you. Now I wind it down with this. If you are a student athlete, do the best that you can. There's good things out there for you. I love this school because they make sure that student comes before athlete. A whole lot of high schools I go to, it's, it's athlete and they're weak students. And then they wonder why they don't make it in college. Some don't even make it past high school with that. So you should be glad that you're here. George Walton is one of the best institutions, not only in the state, but also in the country. So with that said, have a great weekend. Nice to be in front of you.